Welcome to another episode of Raising OKC Kids Conversations with Metro Family in Oklahoma City. I'm Kirsten Holder, and today we're talking with Philip Keith Armstrong, the first president of the newly opened Greenwood Rising Museum in Tulsa. Welcome, Phil. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you, Kirsten. Yes, we're so glad to have you. So just to start out with some introductions, Phil is a native of Ohio, but has lived in Tulsa for more than 20 years. He holds a bachelor's in mass communications from Central State University in Ohio and a master's degree in public administration from the University of Akron. Phil has a varied background in working in the corporate sector, as well as an entrepreneur in the restaurant industry. Then in 2019, he was hired by the Tulsa Community Foundation as the project director for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission to lead all coordination for fundraising, educational curriculum, economic development initiatives, and construction projects, namely the building project of the Greenwood Rising Black Wall Street History Center. In July 2021, he officially transitioned into his new role, which is what you're in right now as the interim director for Greenwood Rising. So first and foremost, I'd love to hear more about your experience at the museum this far. Um, it just opened its doors in 20, uh, excuse me, in August of this year. So tell us what opening weekend included um, and what it meant to Tulsa residents, Oklahoma residents, and even beyond to have a museum of this significance open its doors. Well. First of all, imagine what it would be like for your family to have had this experience and you are in 2021, you are two generations removed and you may have been one of those fortunate enough that the family history has been passed down to you as to what happened to your family, um, what happened to the lineage that was not passed down to you, lineage being someone of a significant financial uh, status uh, that owned incredible financially profitable businesses uh, and that through hate um, and racial animosity, it was completely destroyed um, and they were either unable to rebuild or they have been, may have been killed in that. And, you are the second, maybe third generation removed. And that history has been covered up. That history has not been taught. Outside of maybe a real vibrant history teacher in school, most people have gone their whole lives and never even heard of that. But that's your family. That's your family history. It means something to you. And to finally see a multi-million dollar facility that is dedicated to teaching about not of the tragedy, the horrific tragedy, but to teach about how your family lineage comes out of this incredible, vibrant time period where the Oklahoma territory became a paradise, literally became a respite for Black Americans that wanted to escape the post-racial realities after 1865 and found Oklahoma, of all places, to be that paradise where Black citizens could live free without persecution, uh, without fear of uh, racial injustices from the Ku Klux Klan. They literally had opportunity to pursue their quote unquote American dream own land, have businesses, and live within their own communities and the protective nature of their community and live free um, for many, many multiple years. And your family lineage is a part of that. Um, to have a place, a Smithsonian world-class style history center that tells that full story, addresses it, acknowledges it, and becomes a place where people are traveling literally at this point all over the country, and we've even had people come around the world already to see it. Um, imagine what that would do for you. Imagine being able to bring your children, now that may be the great, great, great grandchildren of your lineage, and now you have a place to bring your children to, to say that was your great, great grandfather, or your great, great, great grandmother, and they own this business, and they own it at this address, and they were a part of this incredible community 
And that is the lineage, that's the bloodline running through you. Never forget that. Imagine how empowering that is. Mm -hmm. And to be at a place in our history, in Tulsa's history, to be able to say we have the love and the support of private donors and corporations and communities to say, we want to see this happen. Black, white, red, brown, young, old, Republican, Democrat, we want this to happen. It's well beyond time and it's still on time. Um, and because of where we are in our country, we need this message more so now than ever. So that, uh, I know it's a long answer, but you know, it's, 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 been, a, it's been a journey. It's been a, a journey filled with a lot of, we made a lot of mistakes. We hit a lot of potholes along this journey. Um, but to be here at this point, and after uh, we open our doors to the public August the 4th, here we are, um, you know, making our way into the fourth month, and we're seeing almost 20,000 people come through. That's obviously more than just Oklahomans. Um, there are people coming literally from all over the country, from every state. I even saw a message from a couple that visited here a week and a half ago from Rhode Island. And I'm not trying to disparage anybody from Rhode Island, but I kind of had stepped back and I said, Rhode Island, really? Is, did, this message has gotten that far that people from Rhode Island are actually coming to Tulsa to spend the weekend and come see this history. That's the impact that this is happening. And people are walking away, not feeling begrudged or emotionally distraught. It, you walk away feeling empowered, feeling like, you know what, I wanna take what I've learned here and take it back to my community. How a community deals with its horrific racial past and use that as the backdrop to create a space for healing, for racial reconciliation, to get us on this journey to, to racial harmony, using that to get people to commit to making some changes in their lives personally that can help us on this path to racial harmony. It's having a tremendous impact and people are wanting to take what they learn here and go back to their communities and share it. Um, that's what's happening. And it's, it's happening in pretty short order. I so appreciate you breaking that down for us. Um, anyone who knows about the Tulsa race massacre, you know, comes away with their own ideas, their feelings, their opinions, um, but really driving home the impact of legacy and reconciliation. I just love that that you talk so in depth about that because that is um, both of those things, both of those themes create that foundation so that we can all grow no matter if our family was related to the incident or not, um, but especially those who were impacted. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more, um, but I'd like to talk about right now the location of the museum because that's also very important. Um, it, it was the location of um, Black Wall Street. Um, it was recognized as a Black business mecca, um, and as we described, the site of one of the worst examples of racial violence in our country. Talk to us about the significance of this museum. As you mentioned, being able to um, you know, family members that are coming there to talk and say physically, this is where this business lived. Talk a little bit more about the significance of the location of Greenwood Rising. So historically, um, the, the term, the, the, the coined phrase, Black Wall Street, uh, actually, you know, this is all about education and enlightenment uh, as far as the center is concerned. So people even learn where that came from and what the original phrase was. It's actually uh, back in 1905, um, the fame and literally the fame of what was happening in the state of Oklahoma in terms of black achievement and businesses and where you can live and, and live well because of land ownership and because of oil and gas discovery. Obviously anybody who had land in the late 1880s and early 1900s, whether you were white, whether you were African-American or, or, or Native American, you, you, you got wealthy. You may be, they literally had people becoming millionaires overnight. And so the fame of what was happening in the territory of Oklahoma was spreading all over the United States. Um, and so one of the people who came to see it for himself was Booker T. Washington. He came here in 1905. The first business didn't get started until a man named, by the name of Ottawa Gurley, O.W. Gurley, purchased the first plot of land and created a business, a boarding house. That was until 1906. He's 
called the father of Black Wall Street because he started that Greenwood business mecca. But that wasn't until 1906. Then the question is, what did Booker T. Washington see in 1905? It wasn't Greenwood. It was the historic Black towns all around Oklahoma that had these booming communities of Black people that are living and take care of themselves and, and vibrant, rich economies locally. He went to all these Black towns. Foley, Oklahoma had a Black-owned bank. Langston, Oklahoma, well, we know that led the way to Langston University. Um, Taft and Redbud and Okmulgee and Muskogee and the list goes on and on and on. And it is reported that after going through a few of these towns and seeing Black people own their land, own their houses, the haberdasheries, the businesses, all owned by Black people living their lives free, um, he made the comment, this is like living in Negro Wall Street. Of course, there's no... Um, uh, stock and, and, and mercantile exchange system here, but it was the best association that he could think of, of, I've never seen basically this many black people living in a communities across a state and living so well. This is not, we don't even see that, we don't see this anywhere else in the country. It's Negro Ning Wall Street here. So that's where that phrase came from. And then in the 1960s and 70s, you know, it was the, the, the coining of that phrase was changed to Black Wall Street. So that's where that term, number one, comes from. So Black Wall Street was really, the best descriptor of that is Black Main Street, the, the Greenwood Avenue from Archer, Greenwood and Archer, northward for almost a mile. The Greenwood Avenue is where all the Black businesses grew and came out of. So you can imagine Greenwood being the place where you went to do all your shopping, where you went to the restaurants, where you went to the theaters, everything was on Greenwood for Black people. And then the homes and the neighborhoods surrounded the arterial streets around Greenwood, around the Greenwood Avenue. And that whole area was called Greenwood. 10 to 12,000 African-Americans living here in the early 1900s, 33 to 35 city blocks. And it's Black achievement. Um, that would have been incredible to see today, but imagine what it was like in the turn of the century and, and juxtaposed to what was going on around the country with Jim Crow and segregation and, and harsh, harsh racial conditions in the South and Houston and Texas and Mississippi and Georgia and Atlanta, the list goes on and on, but you could come to Oklahoma and be free from that. That's the part that people are just being awakened to. You know, no one realized, no one's ever been taught that Oklahoma was this place for black people? Um, before you get to the tragedy of 1921, you would find out, wow, Oklahoma was an incredible place for, 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 for black people in general. And that's what people are coming awake to. But Greenwood and Archer is where that black Main Street, Black Wall Street began. The building sits on the north, I'm sorry, the southeast corner of Greenwood and Archer. So even building it here has historical significance. It, it was the gateway to where the business district began. So to have the Black Wall Street History Center sitting in that corner has prominent significance. And I also have to acknowledge the land. The reason Black citizens settled in this area is because it was an allotment to the freedmen, those who were Black citizens who were freed because they were slaves of the five so-called civilized tribes. And this land area here, land mass, uh, was a, an allotment of the Muscogee Creek tribe. And on June 14th, 1866, they released their slaves with a treaty with the US government to release their slaves in Oklahoma. And part of that treaty was they would agree to give any of those that can tie their bloodline lineage through the tribes because black citizens who were slaves of the tribes intermingled, they married, they actually became a part of the tribe and had families. So any of them who became freed, freed men, got all the rights and privileges of being a part of that tribe and that meant land. And so this allotment that we're sitting, that this building sits on was an allotment of the Muscogee Creek freedmen, uh, land that was given to those black citizens who were freed from their indentured service to the Muscogee tribe. And so all of this just has incredible, incredible, rich, deep uh, history for the roots of Oklahoma black citizens in general. All these events you just mentioned are so significant. And 
I bet most people that walk through your doors, this might be the first time they're hearing them, which is so unfortunate, but it makes it all the more important for you to be talking about that. Um, and especially Oklahoma being an Indian nation um, and on and on, you know, the location of your museum is so many, so many things we can yes. pull out of just what you said, but so many things that we all should be learning every day in our class. You can imagine, uh, you can imagine the eyebrows that pop up when people, you can see them saying, wait a minute, Indians own slaves? I mean, people are finding out that for the first time. And you explain, that's how they got here. You know, the trails of tears was not just the five civilized tribes you know, leaving their lands in the South and coming to Arkansas, Oklahoma, they brought their slaves with them, African slaves. That's how Black people initially got to Oklahoma because of their indentured service under the, the, the tribes. And people, you can just see them saying, like, why am I just now hearing that? Like, you can see them trying to think, how can I not know this, you know, that Indians own slaves, you know? So. Yes, well, and history is told by those who have the upper hand. So, yes. you know, that is just a, a great perspective to keep in mind as we go through this interview, but also all the more important for interviews like this and establishments like this as well. So um, you mentioned a couple people, um, everyone in Oklahoma is familiar with Booker T. Washington, but I'd love to talk about a few more significant figures um, within your museum. O.W. Gurley, you mentioned as the father of Black Wall Street, opening his first business, but there are so many other important ones. Mm -hmm. um, a few that are listed on your website include mm -hmm. J.B. Stratford, Simon mm -hmm. Barry, A.C. Mm -hmm. Jackson, B.C. Yeah. Franklin, John yes. and Lula Williams, Mabel B. Little, A.G. Mm -hmm. Smitherman, Ellis Walker Woods, and J.D. Mann, just to name a few. Um, and I know it's so hard to not be able to talk about all of them in this interview, but we'd love to pick out a few of those that our listeners sure. may not be familiar with to really sure. highlight um, their contributions to Black Wall Street. You, you really highlight, um, and what I try to explain and our docents explain is that these are just examples. You know, these are the prominent names, but they're just examples of the achievement that was happening um, and, and black citizens being able to do very well economically. Um, but uh, just taking a couple of them. So J.D. Stratford, um, he owned uh, the Stratford Hotel. At that time, it was the largest black owned boutique hotel in the United States, 224 hotel rooms. Now, 224 hotel rooms is a big hotel in today's standards. You know? Imagine, you know, in the early 1900s, what a 224 hotel room would be and the significance of that, and that it is owned and operated and built by a Black person. But trying to give that context of, you know, this was incredible achievement. Mm -hmm. um, what other place in the state of the United States, or what other state in the, in the United States at that time, would have been able to say, the largest hotel, pretty much even in comparison to white hotels, is in Oklahoma and it's owned by a black guy and it's a boutique hotel. You know, it was a five star hotel. Um, so that's, you know, and, and of course he owned other businesses, but, you know, the Stratford Hotel was a prominent place with you had money and you were a person of, of affluence for African Americans. You know, you came to Oklahoma and you stayed in the Stratford Hotel. It was, it was like staying. The best way to, you know, I don't know how many of your listeners know, viewers know Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the famed Mayo Hotel that, you know, was re refurbished and now is a top staple again as a boutique hotel. But that's the best way to compare it. It's like going to Tulsa and staying at the Mayo Hotel. You know, not just anybody stays at the Mayo Hotel. You know, you, you got money, you got, you got influence. And that's, that's what, and to build a 224-room hotel that stayed occupied, it lets you know the prominence that it had. Simon Berry one of the richest black men really kind of to live in history and all that he did. He owned property, he owned businesses and, and apartment houses, but he got his claim to fame really by his ingenuity. There's words and phrasings that we use today, such as black excellence. You kind of may hear that from time to time in urban areas and kind of a new phrasing. And what that really refers to is this entrepreneurial drive and creativity that came out of this ability for Black citizens in Oklahoma to say, if I can dream it, I can do it, and nothing will hold me back. That's really the, the, the Black Wall Street spirit. Um, and it's amazing what can happen when you just gifts, hey, this is your area, 
you can go as far as you can dream and nothing will hold you back. And that's what happened to these black citizens. We're free from slavery. We're free from those that don't want us to advance in the South and you can do whatever you want. And so their minds thought about stuff and just did it. He noticed, which when you think about it, it's like, man, how can anybody else not think of that? You know, 33, 35 city blocks of black citizens and they want to get to Greenwood to do their shopping and business shopping. The city of Tulsa had a bus system, but they would not segregation. They would not operate within the Greenwood area. Uh, he saw opportunity. He literally took his own personal Model T Ford, cut the top off of it, and started a jitney service. <laughs> jitney service, for those that may not know, I went to a, a school a couple years ago and I was presenting this information and I asked the students, they were about seventh, eighth graders, and I said, does anybody here know what a jitney servant is? This little boy raised his hand and I called on him and he said, is that like Uber? <laughs> and I laughed because I was expecting him to say it's a taxi, but I didn't think about it for their generation. Right. Yeah, I was like, you're right. That would have been an Uber, you know, back in the 1920s. But that was a jitney service. He started a jitney service and he made so much money from it. The demand he ended up buying more Model T Fords, hiring drivers. He opened it up a mechanic shop because he had to keep the business running and keep the the, the buses going. He ended up buying you know, full-fledged buses like the city of Tulsa. And he did so well that the city of Tulsa ended up just offering to buy out. They're, they're looking, and this is kind of what happens you know, when you look at history and the group of people that are making money and we're missing out on money. So now, oh, well, well, we need to be a part of that. So they made him an offer and bought out his whole bus company. And, and, and then the city of Tulsa came in, but it took him doing it. Yeah. for the city of Tulsa to see how much money we're missing out on. He takes that money and then buys airplanes and has his own air service flying oil barons around the country. The point is, at the height of his success, it is, it is said that he was making nearly $500 a day. Mm. In today's time, 2021, $500 a day is about $189,000 a year. Can you imagine what $500 a day was for a black man in the early 1900s in Oklahoma? You know, that's, that's wealth that, you know, you know, would be like Bill Gates of their time. That would, you know, that would be uh, Elon Musk of their time, $500 a day. Um, and you, you know, talked about A.J. Smitherman. He, had, he owned the black owned newspaper, the Tulsa Star. Um, I even like to talk about Mabel Little, uh, Mabel B. Little. She was one of those people, the black boosterism, the second wave of black citizens that came to Oklahoma was these black towns had some type of newspaper, some type of article, pamphlet. And they were literally sending out pamphlets all across the country that in summary were basically saying, come to Oklahoma. You know, if you're black, if you can get to Oklahoma, you can live the life of your dreams. It was literally that time period was called black boosterism. Hmm. And so a lot of people were responding to, I got to get to Oklahoma. You know, it's black people are living great there. Mabel B. Little was one of those people that responded. Uh, she was living in New York. She moved to Oklahoma. Her first night visiting Greenwood, she writes a journal. It's 1913. She's 16 years old and she writes in her journal her first night experience. The nighttime sky is lit up with all the theaters with an S, all the theaters and nightlife activity of Greenwood. That was her first impression as a 16 year old coming to Greenwood, and that's 1913. Yeah. Um, it just, again, these are some samples, but I just, even as we read these things and read these accounts and get this history and see old black and white photos, we just don't have anything to compare, to think about what that must have looked like and what that experience may have been for black people to come to Oklahoma and see this. Like it's what, what I've landed in paradise. Um, and paradise, not so much, you know, hey, black people live by themselves. It was black people were allowed to live their lives mm -hmm. and pursue their dreams economically, just like white people were able to. So in a sense, you coming to a place where we can live equal with the white man. Mm -hmm. They live over there, we live over here, we're segregated. But 
my skin color does not dictate whether they have a determination on how good I can live. I can live just as good. And in most cases, what we're finding out, they live better. Mm -hmm. And ironically, that's what started to cause the racial animosity is that these railroad tracks, downtown Tulsa, you can look across the railroad tracks and see all this activity. Black people driving nicer cars than the average white citizen. You know, they're living well. They're, you know, they're making money. They, you know, they have these businesses. And if you were a person that believed a certain way, you know, the way the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacy thought at that time, that it was not supposed to be. And it's, that's what caused, ironically, the success of Greenwood also drove the racial animosity that built, that was bubbling over, that went in to destroy them. Ah, hearing all those things just fills you up with so much joy, but then it, it does, it's a harsh reminder of what you just said, that um, all those luxuries and amenities did uh, eventually get taken. And I think we can all agree that systemic racism is absolutely insidious. Um, and it is a harsh reality that emerges when talking about the Tulsa race massacre, the impact on gener generational wealth that you mentioned earlier. Can you break down what it really means so we can fully understand why the Tulsa race massacre will continue to impact Black Americans to come from an economic and financial perspective? It's an excellent question. And I've been asked that before and I've used this comparison. I think it's the best comparison that I can use. And I'm gonna go to 2000 and eight, when the first six months of Barack Obama's presidency, there is a, a photo and it, it impacted me. I can say this, I, I remember, I think I remember even shedding a tear from the joy of what it represented. There's a famous photo of a young black boy, probably looked like he's about seven or eight years old. And this picture is Barack Obama as the president in the um, White House uh, in the, 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 the office of the, the presidency. And he's bent over so that this little boy can touch his hair. Many white Americans looked at that and like, what's the big deal? You know, some understood, but for black Americans, immediately what you saw is this little boy is getting introduced to the most powerful man in the world who is black like him, and guess what? His hair is just like mine. It may seem simple, it may seem like what's the big deal, but for black citizens, it allowed for that boy to see what he could become. I can become just like him. I could be the president of the United States. Um, and we knew what that represented. And that's why that picture is so meaningful. I use that as a comparison to say, when people study this, when teachers study this, and they teach it in context of what people were able to achieve here, it allows for people to stand back and say, man, imagine the number of Black citizens that if they were taught this history in school, instead of being a grown adult and then get to college and hear about this, imagine in Oklahoma public schools, back in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, if this type of achievement of what black citizens could achieve to their business level, their acumen, their professionalism, their civic duty that they felt that it was important for them, literally, let's show the white man that we can be just as productive, we can be just as efficient, we can be just as professional, let's show them what we can do. And maybe they'll start to accept us as equals. Imagine being taught that instead of it being hidden. Um, what would it have done and what it would have planted in many minds and many seeds planted in those kids' minds? Um, and then even as the tragedy, would we still be as divisive as we are in 2021 if we could have been taught what happens when racial animosity and jealousy and fear reaches a pitched fervor and false accusation and false narratives and one side being pitted against the other 
listening to their own bubbles of influence of what they should think about the other group being separate and watching that build and build and build and build. Does any of this sound familiar? Yes, I was just about to say. We are repeating true. history. Mm. We're repeating history. Um, those of us who stand on this side of the history are looking with utter amazement of where we are as a country, mm -hmm. politically divided, racially divided. And we're sitting back here and we're going, oh my gosh, we've been here before. Uh, it's a different context and a different time period, but all the rudiments are still the same. This group thinks this about the other group. No one's really spending time with each other. And those thoughts and those feelings, many of them backed up by false narratives are being built and being built and that animosity is rising. And we see that same potential um, that was here in 1921, here now. So the impact of teaching this, all the good, all the bad and yes, the ugly. This is uncomfortable history. As you know, in, in, in Oklahoma, we have H bill, uh, House Bill 1775 that was passed, unfortunately, to say that it's you shouldn't teach, in summary, you shouldn't teach history or teach anything that makes one class of people feel uncomfortable. Um, and that's, I'm being very generalistic. And what we try to press upon people is that difficult history is uncomfortable. Um, no one or no one from my organization and no teachers that I know are teaching this in a way to say, if you're white and you have to accept the responsibility that this is just in your blood and you're just gonna do it, that's horrible. I wouldn't teach that. I wouldn't stand by a teacher that would teach that. But to say, hey, there was a time and period in our history where white supremacy, and the Ku Klux Klan permeated every aspect of our society, socially, politically, economically, and it had demonstrative effects on people of color, on Asians, on Latino. It's not your fault, it's not my fault, but it's a part of the history. Um, yes, there are shining crown moments of achievements where we can stand and say, my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, but you can't just embrace that and not look at some of the crap that human beings did to other human beings mm -hmm. and the role that um, those who believe in the practice of white supremacy and Ku Klux Klan had in that. You have to teach all of history. And when you teach that, maybe we wouldn't be at this point where people are just being awakened to, there was this race riot, there was this massacre, and it was really fueled by jealousy, by hatred, by false narratives, maybe we wouldn't be in 2021 trying to wave the alarms for people to say, hey guys, we've been here before. You ever heard of the what happened in 2021, 1921? Well, let me tell you and educate you on it so that we don't continue down this path. Maybe we would not be here in as society if this had been taught, all of it, the good, the bad, the I know this building project was a long time in the making, but it does feel very coincidental and um, very timely to have opened in the climate that we're in right now. And I hope that that's something that you and your staff are very proud of as well, um, to be able to tell these stories um, and, and to be able to educate, like we just said, because, because a lot of us have not learned about these stories, unfortunately. And with the house bill being passed, um, many of our kids may not in the classroom at least. But I'd like to know how we as parents can do a better job of educating our kids. Um, you mentioned why it's so important. I think we understand why it's important, but I think we also need some, some help and guidance on, yeah. uh, on talking about it with our kids. And then further, what can we expect when we visit the museum um, for the first time and some of those lasting impressions that you're hoping to leave visitors with, specifically families? Actually, it's a really, really great question. So um, sitting down with your children white or black or any other, and to have a conversation about, uh, about the truth of our history, that, hey, you know, there's some things that we need to talk about. Um, and not just, you know, for people of color. You know, there are times in our history where uh, I think the phrasing is man's inhumanity to man. And, and there are some, some points in our history where that was done. You can go back to 
even you know the the role that Hitler played and 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 the role of of white supremacy or or, or the swastika and, and and the role that that played in Germany. You can you can look at that aspect. You can you know come to the United States and 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 look at you know what happened to you know Native Americans and and the history of what they endured through the Trail of Tears and then the events that really um, was against you know Native Americans and, and the discovery of, of this of, of, of American land and uh, Native American lands. Uh, you can talk about the role of, of after war after the um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and how the United States just went through and you know interned American fellow American citizens just because they had you know any a direct tie to you know the Asian community. Um, now we have since apologized for those. There are have been reparations bills, and in the last uh, latter part of Ronald Reagan's presidency, he signed legislation for monetary reparations to those who experienced those events that what I just talked about. But sitting down with your children to say, you know, we celebrate Fourth of July. We celebrate the independence of the United States from the tyranny of Great Britain. That covers all of us, white, black, red, brown. But we also, guess what? There's a thing called Juneteenth. What's Juneteenth? <laughs> Juneteenth is when black people celebrated their true freedom. What's their true freedom? Well, you know, they abolished slavery in 1863, but some people didn't want to really acknowledge it. And it wasn't until two years later that, you know, this place in Galveston, Texas, and the black slaves there were finally made free after two years of, of the abolishment. And that happened on June 19th, 1865. And so for years, black communities around the United States, they call it Juneteenth, where they truly celebrate a time that they were truly freed in America. That's, there's nothing uncomfortable about that, but teaching it that way and kids are like, oh, okay, so Juneteenth is cool. Yeah, Juneteenth is cool, you know? That's how you teach it. You sit down and just talk to your kids. And then you talk about, hey, we're going to go to Greenwood Rising today. Just like you're going to go to, you say, we're going to go to Sherwin, Willem, Sherwin Miller Museum, and we're going to learn about Jewish culture, and we're going to learn about the Holocaust, and we're going to learn about some wonderful things, and we're going to learn about some horrible things. But it's all about learning what was in our past and what we're, what we're made of as, a hum, as, as human beings. We're going to go to Greenwood Rising today. We're going to learn. We're going to learn about Black people and how they had an incredible life here in Tulsa, and then how it was wiped out by, you know, people who hated that. And then it came back and they rebuilt it again. And this is some incredible people. And we're going to learn about them today. You don't have to take a like a long psychological approach to try to, kids are really, really resilient. It's just knowing that mom and dad wants to show them this and let them know it's a part of our history. It doesn't make kids hate America as some people think, it doesn't make you mad that I'm an American citizen. For me, my mother taught me this history when I was a young boy. She wanted me to be proud of being a black, young black man. And never forget you are a young black man growing up in America. And some people love that and some people don't like it. And that's just the way things are. How you handle it and how you deal with it is more a reflection of you, not of them. That's what my mother taught me. So I've learned that and knew this history all my life and not once have I ever said, I hate America because of slavery. You know, it's, it's history. Mm -hmm. It's sad and tragic history, but it allows me to actually say, you know, it's a miracle that we're still together as a country. Yeah. <laughs> the things that we have done to other people, that Americans have done to other Americans in the name of America, um, it is this democracy experiment that we're still on. It's amazing that we still are and still will be, as far as I know, the foreseeable future, the most powerful and the most free and the most wonderful place to live for achievement, for personal achievement in the world. And that same place also has a horrible track record as it relates to the history of treating certain people in certain groups. Um, but that's what makes us who we are as Americans. We learn from our history. We don't stay in that history. We learn from it and move forward. And how much more, um, how much less, you know, mind blowing could it be if you're introducing it in an age appropriate way as your children grow, you know, you're not becoming an adult and hearing all of this for the first time and having to reconcile with everything you learned, you know, giving those small bites along the way um, as part of an American identity. 
and then shaping it, you know, as they get older, and then they can learn more as they get older as well, and maybe be more accepting of that because it's a common thread you planted all along. So I really like that, you know, and and you kind of mentioned this even in your examples of talking to kids. Kids will shape their opinions based on what your expression is and what your feelings are. And so if you can present it in a light way, and this is just something we're doing and we're learning and it's fun, you know, that that is, that's a great tip. I, I really like another, that. Another, another that thing I want to point out too is it also shows the hidden biases that we still have, that mm. some still have when it comes to teaching the history of Black Americans in totality in America. When you compare it to, when you, when you take it in a different, different subset, you don't see the pushback when you say, hey, let's go to Tahlequah and learn about Native American history, mm. learn their culture and see, eat, eat, go to some of the restaurants, eat their food, buy some of their arts and crafts. And we're going to learn about the Trail of Tears. And we're going to learn about what happened and how they you know, were really mistreated and, 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 and gone through. You're going to learn all of that. And there's no pushback. Yes, let's learn that. If you go to I already mentioned it, the Sherwin Miller Museum. You're gonna learn about the Jewish culture, all the wonderful things that you know you may not know about what they celebrate and what the Jewish culture is, and you're gonna learn about the Holocaust. This is that same type of approach. You're gonna learn about black history through the eyes of what was happening in Oklahoma at the turn of the century. And it's incredible history. It's also pretty tragic history. But you don't have the same pushback. Only when you start talking about the race massacre or the race riot that took place here, you have people say, well, I don't know if we should do that. I don't know, it's my, it, it, that lets me know there's still some hidden biases mm. that a person, when you use this context, all of a sudden there's this resistance that comes from somewhere. Where does that come from? You know, why isn't there the same openness to this history as there is to these other two cultural groups. So sometimes people are awakened to maybe some biases they have like, oh man, you're right. Why am I resistant of this? You know, could it, you know, you might remind you of, we've all had it, you know, remind you of when you were sitting around a dinner table and, and Papa and Mama are saying things about people that, you know, you probably can't repeat, <laughs> but you grew up with that and you, that's the way they, Call, that's what they called those people. And that's what they said about them. And you grew up as a child and you are an adult realizing, man, I kind of, mm, those things seeped in deeper to my psyche than I, re than I thought. Why would I be so resistant to this? Where does that come from? So it's really allowing a lot of people to expose things. And also want to say, this is not just about Black people. This is about the role that white America had, or white citizens in Oklahoma. Not everyone, I tell this to, to the high school and students, Please don't get this misinterpretation that every white person in Oklahoma was trying to kill black people. You know, the, the massacre had a mob of estimated numbers between 1,500 and 2,000 members. There were over 90,000 people on the census in 1920 in Tulsa. The overwhelming majority of white Tulsa was horrified at what took place. I mean, think about it. They went to bed. Most of them had no idea that something was going on downtown Tulsa at 10.30 at night on May 31st. They wake up on June the 1st and they look out the window and they see billowing smoke and planes flying around and what is going on? So the majority of white citizens were horrified. What is, they did what? And then weeks later when an entire community is destroyed, yeah, we have church minutes from the Holy Cathedral Catholic Church, downtown Tulsa, First Presbyterian mainly, their minutes uh, show it, and even some from the First United Methodists, where their church groups went and found and harbored some mm -hmm. of the Black citizens and those who were victimized, hid them, fed them, clothed them in their church basements. So there was an outpouring of love from, it's just that the events and the course that it took, those that were out to do this damage um, really destroyed so much in such a short period of time that it completely overwhelmed the black citizens and then took everyone else by surprise. Again, they wake up the next day and they see half the city on fire. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That'd be shocking no matter what um, the context was, but especially in this context. I appreciate you sharing that background too. <clears throat> So one of the topics in the museum is reconciliation. Um, you talked a bit about racial bias and maybe uncovering racial bias that we didn't know exists because it's planted so deep in our past. Um, but I'd really like to talk about how we move forward and how Greenwood mm -hmm. Rising talks about moving forward. Yeah. How can the next generation deal with racial divides better than ours has and better mm -hmm. than past generations have as well? So there, the, the final exhibit, um, and the, the four exhibits you go through is the Greenwood Spirit, the Arc of Oppression, the Changing Fortunes Gallery, where they rebuilt, and we'll talk about that history. And then number four is the Journey Toward Reconciliation. And that is an amphitheater style, classroom style space room. And that's where when field trips begin in January, with the eighth grade classes at Tulsa Public Schools, teachers, after their students go through, this is where the teacher then can have that educational moment can reflect what, what did you learn? How is this coinciding with what we've been teaching in the classroom? We learn this history from, from books and, and words and letters on pages and tablets, but now you get to see it in an immersive way, uh, experiential way, and then get children's feedback, you know, and then say, what are we learn? What can we learn from 1921 that we need to utilize now? Do you see any similarities in our society? Do you see things that we need to address? and how we can change where we are so that we repeat back. That's what Green and Rising really impacts. It says, what can we learn from the past that can help us heal and get on this journey to racial reconciliation and harmony that this country needs, that this city needs, and that's happening on a daily basis. And then the last thing, you leave that space, and before you leave, you walk into this commitment chamber. And literally all it is, is you can leave a commitment. There are tablets there, there's QR codes where people can leave it through their phone. And it's this huge wall of commitments that people have made. Hmm. And the question is, how will you help get on the journey to racial reconciliation? And in 30 words or less, you can leave a commitment and you can see examples of commitments that other people have left. And there's some interactive digital boards. So when you enter your commitment, you see your commitment add to the wall right before your very eyes. Some of them are simple as uh, one of my favorites and I use all the time is somebody put, I commit to having lunch once a week with somebody who's different from myself. Mm. That's powerful. Mm. I mean, it, it is just as something as simple as I'm going to intentionally have lunch with somebody and just learn about them. I, I, somebody, I'm not going to bump in at church. I'm, I don't work around them. How can I get introduced to this person other than let's go to lunch? I don't know anything about you. You don't know anything about me. Let's talk. But anyhow, you, you, you know, you leave a commitment of what you want to do, small steps that you'll take that that when you leave here, you didn't just walk through history. You're taking a piece of it with you and you're leaving a commitment that I'm going to change something in my life that's going to help our society move forward. Oh, that is so powerful. And to see all those visuals on the wall, I have not had the pleasure of attending yet, but you just painted this powerful visual of us all coming together in those in those commitments and making them live in front of everyone makes it a little bit more real to us too. So that, that sounds fantastic. So I love talking about the commitment that we all can leave um, at your museum. Um, I'd also like to talk about some of the ways that we can get more hands-on within the museum. What kinds of programs, classes, or workshops can we expect in the future? So the programming, 80% of our program funding that we've raised uh, already and have funding in place is for school field trip programs. Uh, again, it'll begin with Tulsa Public Schools they were the first to work with the Centennial Commission back in 2018 to redesign what's being taught in classes and the Oklahoma Department of Education under Joy Hoffmeister uh, worked with us as well to redesign this is being taught. Um, as far as even uh, uh, with intentionality, putting together the pedagogy, pedagogy is an academic term, how you teach this to different age groups, uh, beginning with the third grade. And so, uh, we actually have a five-day curriculum and a one-day curriculum that teachers from anywhere can download for free if they wanted to teach this in their classes. But the um, eighth grade classes of TPS will start in January. Once we tweak it, once we figure out we've got it down pat and 
getting classrooms and schools through here. You know, we want to increase that funding so we can open it up fall 2022 as a uh, goal and a target date to open it up to the other school systems, whether it be Jinx or Wasso or uh, Glenpool or Catoosa uh, and private schools. And then 2023 and beyond to continue to raise funding so that field trips can come from all over the state of Oklahoma. Uh, I imagine a history teacher in the panhandle of Oklahoma that says, you know, I'd love to bring my children and spend the day in Greenwood and come see it and come to that museum. And I can say, hey, we've got funding. We'll pay for the bus and we'll pay for the driver. Just give me the students and we'll bring them here. That's what we want to provide. So that's the main uh, aspect of our funding. We also have a program that will take a virtual tour experience of Greenwood Rising to classrooms that hey, I wish I could bring my students there. We can't afford that type of trip. We're creating a program where they can take a virtual tour and get the history. Um, and that's being funded by some major national partners so that school districts around the country can experience that. Those are the two probably big platforms working on. We're also you know, being working with the community to have an annual commemoration, um, an annual type of time to sit back, reflect, learn this history, commemorate the history, uh, and always have an annual reflection of what took place in 1921, but the history is in general. We're, you know, maybe call it Greenwood Homecoming or Homecoming Home and remembering each year. And then we'll have Health Equity Day, an economic and educational day and during, during that time period. So those are just some of the highlights. We just completed our first programming this past weekend. The Oklahoma Center for Community and Justice partnered with us uh, for the Youth and Race Leadership Forum, where they literally bring high school students they come to Green Rising, they spend three days, uh, a Friday evening, a full day Saturday, and then the following full day Saturday where they talk about these issues. They learn this history and they learn how to go back to their schools and be leaders about acceptance, about mm -hmm. understanding the differences and the backgrounds that various people come from, learning how to acknowledge them, respect them, and respect each other, uh, and learn how to build relationships in spite of our racial differences. Um, so that was a very powerful program. And so that's, uh, so that's just kind of a, those are probably our key highlighted programs that we will be doing. Um, and then in, in between our tours and our daily tours, uh, we'll have small evening programs where we can use that discussion space that I talked about, where we can have community conversations, invite people here from different parts of the community and talk about could you imagine having a program? Let's talk about the Ahmad Arbery shooting and the trial mm -hmm. and get people in the room that have different opinions and say, this is a safe space for us to talk about, you know, why do you feel the way you feel about this? And let us hear from each other and give people that respect to just, hey, this is what I feel about it. Um, and, and have a space where you can actually have these discussions, these discussions that you want to have, but you don't feel like you can say the right thing or get chastised if you say it the wrong way creating a space where we can all sit down in a room and just talk about some of the things. And that's just an example of some of the programs and the utilization of Greenwood in this community and for this city. Absolutely. You guys have so many good things on the horizon um, and discussion and learning and open-mindedness as the themes through all of those. So I just love that. Um, speaking of traveling uh, to your museum, most of our listeners are from the OKC Metro and may want to take a weekend out visiting this new museum. So I'd love to hear about some other top spots around Greenwood Rising oh, wow. and yeah. in Tulsa for families to learn yeah. more about the massacre, about Black Wall Street, and just have fun together. You can spend literally an entire day um, because Greenwood Rising really gives you the history in a very, of course, professional, educational, and immersive way. And when you walk out the building, you, you want to see, honestly, you just want to see more. Where else can I go? So we give you the opportunity to take a guided tour. Uh, we created a uh, Greenwood XR tour, an extended reality tour where it takes you on different stops and different places in, in Greenwood, right around the Greenwood Rising History Center where you, you pick up your phone, you download the app, and you have this interactive experience with historical sites. You actually look and see what the Dreamland Theater used to look like, and it's the image where you can actually be a part of it. Uh, you can take a walk along the Pathway to Hope and go over just a block over and see the John Hope Franklin Park, that beautiful park that was dedicated about 11 years ago, um, that's dedicated as a memorial to the lives that were lost, and this beautiful, beautiful statue and, and the history that's there. Um, you can walk across the parking lot, go to Greenwood Cultural Center, 
and go see the history there and see the survivors gallery and see the pictures of all those survivors who had survived and had lived and their history, their picture, their information and see the history there. Uh, you can go to the Vernon Amy Church. That basement is the only surviving structure that is the bricks are still the same brick walls that, that survived the, the destruction and they built the, the new structure on top of those walls and being part of that, that part of that history. Um, you can walk north of there and go to the Booker T. Washington High School uh, Memorial. Um, all these are outdoor spaces um, that you can just spend the day literally. I mean, bring your walking shoes because you can just walk from space to space to space. They're within, uh, I think the, the furthest walk you may have is from here to the most northern port, which is the, the Booker T. Washington Memorial, which is only about a football, like 150 yards or so. But um, plan to spend the day. Plan to spend some money. You know, if you're going to come down here, you know, buy some items and support the Black-owned businesses that are here. We've got uh, an incredible, incredible arts uh, gallery called the Greenwood Gallery. There's a sneaker store called Silhouette Sneaker and Art. There's an incredible restaurant, Soul Food. If you like some good Southern fried chicken and mashed potatoes and, 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 and nice. macaroni and cheese. Uh, there's <laughs> Wanda J's just within walking distance here. Um, there's several shops and several places to go see and just spend an enjoyable afternoon with your family and children. And if you want to make a whole weekend of it, my goodness, you got the Gathering Place, you got the Woody Guthrie Museum, uh, next year the Oklahoma Pops Museum, and all those are in this same area of downtown Greenwood, I mean downtown uh, Tulsa area. So uh, yeah, if you want to come from Oklahoma City, you can spend an entire weekend and truly enjoy a cultural experience. Lovely. You are selling us on it. I think a lot of people are going to be <laughs> listening to this podcast and making their plans right after <laughs> right after they can. So, um, well, thank you so much for joining us today. This has just been an honor and a pleasure learning more about this fab fabulous museum. Um, you know, the history, the liveliness, um, the unfortunate event, and then, and then kind of on from there. And really learning and making these conversations part of the way we're raising our kids is, is really important. And I appreciate all you have spoken into us about those things. So for those of you listening, you can find out more about the Greenwood Rising Museum by visiting www.greenwoodrising.org. I hope you all join us next time on Raising OKC Kids. Thank you, Kirsten.